My name is Dr. Liz Athey Victor, and I'm a professor at Tiffin University, and I'm reading for Band Book Month. And the book that I chose was The Bluest Eye. I'm trying to find the page that has the, uh, the Bluest Eye. And it's a really good book, uh, well written, and I chose it because it speaks to discrimination and the effects of discrimination. And it's a really battered old copy, which will tell you just how good it is, because a lot of people like to read it, and it's just so good. So I'm going to start at the beginning. Here is the house. It is green and white. It has a red door. It's very pretty. Here's the family. Mother, father, Dick and Jane live in this green and white house. They're very happy. See Jane. She has a red dress. She wants to play. Who will play with Jane? See the cat. The cat goes meow meow. Come and play. Come and play Jane. The kitten will not play. See mother. Mother is very nice. Mother, will you play with Jane? Mother laughs. Laugh, mother, laugh. See father? He's big and strong. Father, will you play with Jane? Father is smiling. Smile, Father, smile. See the dog? Bow, wow, wow, goes the dog. Do you want to play with Jane? See the dog run. Run, dog, run. Look, look, here comes a friend. The friend will play with Jane. They will play a good game. Play Jane, play. Here is the house. It is green and white and has a red door. It's very pretty and here's the family. Mother and father, Dick and Jane, and live in the greenhouse. And they're very happy. Jane has a dress. And she just keeps repeating this. And then it goes into very small letters to show how this description of what is supposed to be, you know, the correct family just fills your mind. And then what happens to the people who um, don't have a house like this and a family like this? So it gets good, good just like this as it keeps going. So the beginning of the book is quiet as it's kept. There were no marigolds in the fall of 41. We thought at the time that it was because Bacola was having her father's baby and that the marigolds did not want to grow. A little experimentation and much less melancholy would have proved to us that our seeds were not only the ones that didn't sprout. Nobody's did. Not even from the garden fronting the lake showed marigolds that year. But so deeply concerned were we with the health and safe delivery of Bacola's baby that we could think of nothing else but our own magic. If we planted the seeds and we said the right words over them, they would blossom and everything would be all right. It was a long time before my sister and I admitted to ourselves that no green was going to spring from our seeds. Once we knew our guilt was relieved only by fights and mutual accusations about who was to blame. For years, I thought my sister was right. It was my fault. I had planted them far too down in the earth. It had never occurred to either of us that the earth itself may be unyielding. We also dropped our seeds in our own little plot of black dirt, just as Bacola's father had dropped his seed into his own plot of, uh, plant, plot of black dirt. Our innocence and faith were no more productive than his lust or despair. What is clear now is that all of this hope, fear, lust, love, and grief, nothing remains but Bacola and the unyielding earth. Charlie Breedlove is dead, our innocence too, the seed shriveled and died, her baby too. There is nothing really more to say except why. But since why is difficult to handle, we must take refuge in how.